Well, I started off my career in law enforcement. I'm a former U.S. special agent with the Secret Service. I protected presidents. I actually started under the Clinton administration and protected Clinton, President Bush Jr., and then President Barack Obama. I was actually on his personal detail. But then I've also protected all, essentially almost all the other presidents because when you're a former president, you get protection for life. And in addition to that, I worked cases, a lot of complex investigative cases. The U.S. Secret Service has jurisdiction over very complex crimes. In addition to that, I was an interrogator. I gave the polygraph exams for the U.S. Secret Service. There was a small group of us, and uh, I did interviews related to the cases that we worked. But then I would also help local police departments around the country uh, with their cases when they had a case they were stuck on. And I would come in to say, okay, let me see if I can get a confession, or let me see maybe you're talking to the wrong person altogether. In addition to helping with uh, polygraphs or interviews related to intelligence, threats, anything like that. Let's talk about polygraphs because I'm quite interested in this and I don't know much about it. I've only seen it in the movies and uh, and I want to know I want to know what's real about it and what isn't. How 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 correct are they? How accurate are they? They're as accurate as the person giving it to you. So the interesting thing is everybody thought the the machine was a polygraph. I was I'm the polygraph. I was the polygraph. What this machine does, when, and right now it's a software system, it's literally, it's a laptop computer with software, and it runs, it checks your involuntary system, meaning your blood pressure, blood flow, breathing, heart rate, how much you sweat, they call it the electro, electrodermal activity. These are things you can't uh, consciously control. This is stuff your body controls. You can't tell yourself, okay, sweat more. When your body feels a sense of threat, when you feel a sense of threat, you start sweating more. Your hands get clammy or so you can grip onto things or even be more slippery for somebody to, to hold on to you. I practice Brazilian jiu-jitsu and when someone's super sweaty, I can't, I, I can't grab them. My hands slide. And so all these things that our body does, it's, 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 it's so intelligent. It's designed to protect us from threat. Now, the idea is, though, when somebody is lying, the body and the mind understand it also to be a threat. So I fear the threat of getting caught in a lie. I might go to jail, I might go to prison, I might get in trouble. But even something as simple as you fear being stopped by a police officer, right? Maybe when you're driving, if you're driving fast, you get pulled over, you think, okay, what are the consequences of what could happen to me? I might lose my license to drive, I might pay a penalty, my insurance might go up, there are other consequences. So anytime you feel threatened, our body responds. You don't have to think about it. Your body does it for you. And if you think about that speeding scenario, for you speeding is a scenario, you're driving on the highway, you're going super fast. You see the law enforcement officer in the corner and you do what? What do you do, Spencer, as soon as you see that person? Oh, I panic I straight away. You panic, you put your foot on the brake, you slow down and you're gripping the steering wheel and all of a sudden you feel that emotional change in your body. You didn't tell your body to do it. Your body just did it for you because it's preparing you. So now if your your radio was on, you turn off the music because you want to pay attention because you're distracted by too much. You're focused. You're looking in a rearview mirror. You're gripping the steering wheel. You're ready. All you did was drive by a law enforcement person in the corner, police officer in the corner, and you have this complete change in response. So the same thing happens when people lie. Now, the polygraph itself measures that change. So when you're asking somebody questions, you are measuring that change. Now you'll say to me, well, what if they're nervous? If you're nervous, you're nervous throughout my whole exam. You're nervous for every single question. And your nervousness becomes that new baseline. Now, the other thing, Spencer, that you don't see on TV is before you actually do a polygraph, before you actually, excuse me, put, hook them up to the, the instrument, you've been talking to that person for at least an hour, hour and a half, two hours. You're having a conversation with them. Real interrogators have conversations. A good interrogation, you know how you know a good interrogation is the person has no idea they're even being interviewed. We have a really backward uh, thought process in how interrogations are done. We think through force or even through torture. And if even if you just put that human element of like, is it moral or immoral, put that aside for the moment. In general, you get you don't get good information. Because you may get the truth here and there, but I also may say anything I need to say to you to get you to stop. And that's where now we've wasted resources and money on chasing false leads, on getting bad information. So that's why forcing people to do stuff like that, that never works. 
You want to get people to comply. So going back to polygraph, what you're measuring is the change in the person's body. Now, having said that, the person giving it has to, it's a skill set and a sign. So I have to be very mindful and careful of how I'm giving it. So can I, can I affect somebody in such a way to cause them to fail it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or can I affect somebody in such a way to cause them to, to pass? Possibly. So what you have to do is you have to be extremely ethical. You have to be extremely, you have to be a seeker of the truth because the other issue that happens with interviews and interrogations when you're talking to this community of uh, enforcers is if I come in there thinking, Spencer did this. I know Spencer did this. I need to get it out of him. And I'm thinking you're the guy who committed whatever act. And even if you're arguing with me or even if you're giving me points as to why it could not have been with it been you. I am so biased at this point that it doesn't matter what you say. You you already did it. So all I'm focused on is getting a confession from you. And you can absolutely get people to give false confessions. There's a variety of reasons. And if we look at how they happen and you look at the data, what causes someone to give a false confession? Because because you as an individual be like, I would never give one. Possibly. But when you're in that moment and you're in this weakened state, you don't know how you're going to respond. So one, age is a factor. We see that the younger somebody is, the more easily they're influenced. Uh, we see mental health being a factor. So maybe that person has some type of mental or emotional health issue, or in that moment, they're just extremely weak and vulnerable. The other thing is, is when you look at law enforcement or you look at police, the idea is they are there to help us. We should trust this person. And so because we want to trust them, we will say whatever we want them to say. And then it's also like ability. We want them to like us and believe in us. So we may say whatever they want us to say. So there's so many different factors in which it happens. And we have seen people, at least here in the United States, be exonerated. They gave a false com confession. Yes, I did this. Then it's found later. They actually did not do it. How on earth did they give a false confession? Again, it goes back to the interviewer. So I personally, when it comes to this, uh, I don't think everybody should be doing interviews. I think there should be a system set up within the world, within law enforcement, where you have to have a level of skill set. You wouldn't want any, just anybody going to, you know, look at a bomb and take it apart. They go through special training, through special, uh, special schooling. They practice because you need, you need that certain skill set. Interviewing people in interrogations and polygraphs is the same thing. We need to educate our law enforcement community more, give them the proper tools they need. I even have, I'll give the U.S. Secret Service credit for this. After they trained me in the art and science of, of lie detection, they sent me to get my master's degree in forensic psychology. Because the idea is you need to understand the human mind, people. And we haven't advanced in the sciences. You know, so we need to be better when we talk to people. So going back to your original question, it depends who is giving that polygraph. Because I will tell you, there are times with, with all my reading body language and verbal language and detecting deception, I've been through every school and training you could think of. There are moments in my life where I, where I would sit across from someone and I'm like, I have no idea. I have no clue. Are they telling me the truth or not? You'll get those people where you're kind of, they're outliers. And so the polygraph in and of itself was great because it would show me I just asked this person a series of questions, but there's one question they seem to re be responding to. Why is that? Now, it doesn't mean that they've lied to me. It can be. It can mean that that person's just concerned about it. So I remember once I had an, uh, uh, an applicant, because I used to also do applicants. Anybody who wanted to work in the U.S. Secret Service, there's a very intensive background check, and you would have to take a polygraph. So when I asked this applicant you know about serious crime have you been involved in serious crime and they responded i remember thinking with well, this something about this question they don't like now automatically you would make an assumption oh they must have committed a crime that's why they're responding when in fact there was a family member of theirs who had a, who had committed crimes and had actually been to prison in jail or it was prison or jail i don't remember and that's why he was responding to that question so in that way the polygraph is a great Tool. Well, there you have it. Another fantastic episode of this podcast. Evie was just, wow, what can I say? 
Secret Service agent, lie detectors, police force, 9-11, written a book, TV star, worked with all the presidents. I mean, what else do you need inside the content of a podcast apart from someone that's like that that can share those kind of stories? Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Do me a favor. If you're keen to consider more content, look over there and click there. Also, like to subscribe. You know it'll make me happy. Go on, please. See you soon.